Thank you all for coming. Well, it's called generative AI. You hear this a lot, yeah, because uh, it generates things, right? It generates text, images, pictures, uh, even 3D models, music even. How is this different from before generative AI came about? Well, in the past, they call it typically classification AI, not generative. They don't generate things. They classify things, right? You develop AI in the past to classify it. Is this credit card transaction suspicious or not, right? Uh, is this um, uh, uh, bank transaction good or not, right? Is you asking it question and you ask it to classify. Is this object in the picture a cat or not, right? So it's like multiple choice questions, right? You MCQs. Now, generative AI is when you are generating essays. So like if you think you're in exam, you know, multiple choice type exams and essay type exams. So that's called generative AI. Now, they're typically built with foundation models, right? They are called foundation because they have not been specialized yet. Foundation being you build them out so that you can later specialize them, train them, fine tune them for a speciality. And a lot of these foundation models are built, starting out being large language models. They don't have to be LLMs, but a lot of them are LLMs. And today, this is what I'm gonna focus on, just to zoom in so we understand what an LLM is and what an LLM is not. And then I'll zoom in on today's topic as to the disruptions this will cause and the concerns CXOs have when they are thinking about implementing LLMs in their enterprises. So this follows on from Justin's talk where we are now thinking of CXOs being concerned when deploying them. Okay, let's start with LLMs. If you, if you just remember train, tune, infer, that's it. Right, I've simplified this quite a bit. Data scientists, when I leave this room, you can come up and scold me, but I'm just gonna keep it simple, right? Train, tune, infer. So a lot of these proprietary models, ChatGPT, right, uh, from OpenAI, Microsoft, uh, Claude from Anthropic, Bart from Google, these proprietary models have gone through a lot of training, right? Basically to give them this basic capability, the foundation, the basic capability of grammar. Yeah, those who are uh, in the, around my age who are in Britain, you may have attended grammar school. Instead of you attending primary school, you attended grammar school. It's not just good enough to have vocabulary of words. Grammar is when you know how to string words together in a human-like way. That's basically what we do with these large language models at the beginning. Put them through, basically connect, do lots of connections where everything on the top is connected to everything on the right and so on, and so on, and so on. Lots of, lots of connections, right? And so on, and so on, and so on. It took me a minute to do this, <laughs> right? And it's only 1,000 connections. Some of these bigger models, one trillion connections. We'll be here until next year, clicking, <laughs> and we're still not done. So I, I emphasize this so you get an idea how big these things are. Right, I've drawn 1,000 connections, but these things could have up to a trillion connections. And this connection starts out being zero, every one of them zero. So the goal of training, you send in a trillion words, so you find out the value of every one of those connections. A, a trillion connections come in, imagine, blank. Now you have to fill each of those connections with a value so that it has vocabulary and grammar. So you give it a trillion words. Lots of energy is involved because a trillion connections involve a huge supercomputer and a trillion words involve lots of data being pushed through to fill out the blanks in each of these connections. So that if you gave it a trick question to say, I bought some fruits and notebooks, they tasted great, this thing won't be full. Because it has seen a trillion words and it knows that when you see fruit and taste, they come very close together in the trillion words you have seen. You also even see a stronger connection between food and taste, but every time it sees the word notebook, it doesn't see the word taste nearby. That's why it knows. This is how it builds those connections. 
For every word in the 50,000 words, it builds a connection between that word with every one of the 50,000 words. How strong is this connection to that word? And so on. You can imagine every word has 50,000 other connections. Every other word, 50,000. Every other, so 50,000, 50,000, 50,000 of these connections. Lots of connections. The goal with training them at the beginning is to fill up these connections. Yeah? Know what the value is for each of these connections. A lot of work. That's why now, to build large language models with trillion connections, they are talking about hundreds of millions of dollars. Not many people do, can do this. That's why these models are proprietary, the big ones. Yeah. Later, we'll talk about some open source models that we mentioned in the last talk. After you train them with lots of words, it doesn't mean this, this entity that speaks very well is going to be polite. Right? You have seen all kinds of bad behavior in all those words and politeness all, all mixed. So you never know, without tuning it for behavior, this thing is going to be socially acceptable when you release it to your customers. That's the reason why these proprietary models go through a tuning for behavior phase. Yeah. Here, the proprietary models will hire lots of humans, actually. Right? To check the answer and output of these models, you say, mm, your answer is not polite enough. You should say it this way instead. So this tuning part is much less autonom automatic than the training part. The training part is automatic. You just shove a trillion words through these connections. But in tuning, you have to hire hundreds of people to come in and correct this thing. You have to tune it for behavior, or else you won't dare to release, release it to your customers. I've seen some raw, non-behavioral tune models, and they are not useful. Okay. <laughs> all right. And then finally, once you've done it, you are confident enough, after all the tuning for behavior, you test it, you're comfortable, you release it. And once you release it, when people use it, it's typically called inference. The model is going through inference. When you hear the term inference, essentially you're asking it questions and giving you answers. Yeah. And through that process of inference, it's also highly energy intensive. And then here, you can see there's a blank in there that I left it blank because in proprietary models, typically, this is how, what you do. You deliver, you infer. But when you receive the model, right, when you receive the model and want to use it, you may want to do an additional level of tuning for personality. Because the behavioral training part is for general social acceptable, acceptable behavior. But personality is you want it to act like and talk like you, or act like and talk like your company, or act like and talk like your institution for it to represent your institution. So there is typically also this extra step for many of these companies who want to deliver a model that is proprietary, not just proprietary, but specific to their needs and talk like them. That's basically it, the introduction of uh, what these things do. The behavior part is a part that I would like to spend uh, a little bit time on. And later you'll see why tuning for behavior is something that uh, will affect the consistency of your model because you constantly tune for behavior. Let's have a look. I'm going to show you some models, right? This is a uh, uh, chat GPT-4. Later, I'm going to show you three other models. I'm just going to uh, see it's uh, tuning for behavior. What is your opinion of HPE as a company? Uh, don't worry. For those from HP, I checked. It was quite polite. <laughs> yeah. So I'm just going to uh, click. Yeah, there we go, right? It says, this one has been tuned for behavior to be more conservative. You can see as an AI developed op open AI software, I don't I have personal opinion. I'm sorry. Right, so you can see an example of a tune for behavior here that it doesn't want to give an opinion. I only give you facts that I know. So this is ChatGPT. Let's have a look at, uh, so related to Microsoft here. This one is uh, BARD, related to Google. Ask it the same question. This one takes a bit longer. It's because it buffers up the answer before it gives you to, uh, it to you in bulk. Yeah. Uh, there we go. This one is a bit more, uh, you can see it's willing to give you, it, it doesn't qualify to say, uh, see, you can see it gives you an opinion, right? HP is a strong company. <laughs> right. 
So you can see different tuning for behavior here. Let's have a look at uh, Claude. Claude is by Anthropic and uh, has a lot of connection with Amazon. So you have seen Microsoft connection here. You've seen Google's connection here. And now you see the Amazon connection here. Let's see, let's see what it does. Yeah, it, it doesn't hold back uh, on opinion. It gives you one, right? And then finally, uh, this is an open source model, non-proprietary. It was the demo uh, for those who was, who was in Justin's uh, talk earlier. Yes, no? Ah, okay. You would have seen a demo of, of Llama 2, and I'm going to just show you Llama 2, uh, 70 billion. So it's not a trillion connection here. They use 70 billion. And this is an open source model. It's, again, you can see it says, I do not have a personal opinion. You can see? The point I'm trying to make here is that uh, different models are tuned for behavior differently. They might all be trained for grammar using similar internet data. But then they may have the same kind of grammar, but by the time they're tuned for behavior, they talk very differently. And by the time they are tuned for personality, they talk even more differently. So these are the things that are keep in mind when uh, we are using these models from these different companies. Yeah. Okay. When you are inferring, this is the inference part, right? The inference part also uh, uses up lots of energy. Let me show you uh, why, when you're using the model. So you send in the first piece of word in your question. It fires up the entire, it's, oh, okay, sorry. Let me take a step back and say that these things also take pictures, right? In, in, during the inference phase, you can also send, you can send in text, you can also send in pictures. Here, I'll use another model called Aleph Alpha, Luminous. Yes, I was in a hotel room. This is way back, right? In 22, they already were taking in pictures. And uh, I had an apple in a, in a hotel room, so I just took a picture with my iPhone and then asked it, uh, what do you think? It says, uh, apple on a wooden table. In the earlier days in classification, it will say it is an apple. Here, it is more descriptive. It, it tells you what it sees, right? It says apple on a wooden table. I was quite pleased. Then I got a bit... Uh, Tricky with it. Yeah, I, I found a glass. Yeah, the German glasses in hotels are pretty small, so I put it in front. And then uh, you want to guess what it said? Uh, an apple and a glass of water. I said not too bad. Um, it made a mistake that uh, that the line on the glass was water, right? But let's put it this way: humans can make that mistake too. So there are two things to note about here. These things are not perfect but neither are humans, yeah. right? Then I went all the way out uh, to be tricky. Yeah. Anyone want to guess uh, what it said? Yeah. It said uh, apple juice in a glass. <laughs> <laughs> now, let, uh, hu humans can make mistakes too. If you take a glance, uh, take a quick glance at this, you might say something else that's not correct also. But, you know, I was guessing when I first saw this that, uh, you know, every time it sees... Uh, apple and a glass, you probably see the word juice quite often. Maybe that's the reason why you put it that way. Yeah. But when I spoke to Jonas, who is the co-developer of this model, yeah, and, and the CEO of, uh, of Aleph Alpha, he said that the model has been trained with a lot of humor, a lot of jokes. So he told me this, this sentence, right? I'm not sure, or I don't know if this actually making a joke. So that, this, this sentence he, he, he told me, actually, I, was, uh, I got a bit of goosebump, not because of the joke part, but because he used the word, the phrase, I don't know. He built this. He said, I don't know, right? And it's fully understandable. Because when you start to have hundreds and billions of these connections, it's very difficult to backtrack and figure out why these things are saying things they, the way they are. That's why tuning for behavior is very important. Now I'm going to move on from the introduction part, right, train, train, tune, infer, to the part where these CXOs who are starting to think about implementing these models in their enterprises, what are their concerns? We've been engaging with many CXOs, many data scientists, many leaders in implementing these large generative models, and these 
the following are their concerns. The first and foremost is data. Is their data ready? It is really great that they are asking the question. Right? Some don't even think about asking that question, but is data ready? Well, let's have a look. Data is important because it's related to machine learning and related to AI. How is the, what is the relation? What is the simplest way to connect them? And that is, data is a source of a machine learning to be artificially intelligent. So it all starts with data. So we did a survey of 8,600 plus decision makers globally and asked them to grade level one to level five. Level one, level five is the best in their data situation, data maturity model, meaning their internal data, all their silos are removed, integrated. And that is also connected to their external data and also connected to their real-time data. Perfect, level five. Level one is everything is siloed. Even within their own company, their internal data is siloed. So what's the average after we surveyed 8,600 of them? 2.6. So the data maturity globally is low. If you all are ahead, you are one of the leaders in the industry, number one. Number two, from this, if you start focusing on organizing your data ready for AI training, that alone could make you become a leader in the AI field. Data is the key, right? Data is the source of a machine learning to be artificially intelligent. Well, smaller companies are better, right? And bigger companies are worse. So this is something to note, important thing to bring back to your organization, to start thinking about, if you're not ready to implement any AI projects, start organizing your data so that they are not siloed, at least to start with. And then when asked, is data strategy part of the corporate strategy that is discussed at the board level? 8,600 of them. 87% says no. So if you want to be a leader in the AI world going forward, bring it up, right? It needs to be discussed at the board level to allocate funding to organize your data. This survey was one of the more imp most important surveys we've done to, uh, to help our customers get ready for this new AI era. Yeah. Not all data needs to be collected. Not all data needs to be what you have available to you. Some data is created, can be created. Not all of it, but some is created. I'm going to give you an example of this. It's quite limited, but it's an interesting example so that when you are organizing data to also think about other ways you can get data, right? 97, uh, IBM beat the world top chess player. Full respect. Few, fewer people know that two years before that, a model beat the world top uh, checker player. Then Google, this one, full respect, right? Yeah, beat the world, one of the world top Go player, and there is no, more, no game more complicated than Go. It has 10 to the power 171 combinations. Yeah, no computer, all the computers in the world running for 100 years will only do 10 to the power 30. 171 is crazy big. That's why we only have built mod models that can beat humans in Go. We did not solve Go. Neither have we solved chess. Yeah. 10 to the power 47 is still too big for all the computers in the world. Right. So then, then when HP acquired SGI, I was CTO for SGI, uh, you know, Antonio asked me, so what are you going to do in that blank space for us, for HPE? No game more complicated than Go. My last name is Go. <laughs> so so I, I, picked, uh, I, I picked something simpler. I picked poker, right? So poker has 10 to the power 160, but it has something more complicated than everything else. And that is, in the board games, you know your competitive, competitor's pieces. In poker, your competitor's cards are hidden from you. And number two, one of the big goals of the competitor is to bluff you. 
right? So I thought this would be an interesting one uh, to, to work with uh, Carnegie Mellon University on this. In, in 2017, when the model was sent out against the four top poker players, uh, we lost uh, $700,000. <laughs> Virtual money, right? Uh, the goalie Antonio said, you know, this time around, we weren't that good here. Yeah. Then Professor Sandholm went back and said, after finding out why, the four top poker players said that, uh, you know, uh, it did not bluff very well. Yeah, after about a while, we managed to see the pattern of the way it's bluffing. So Sanhong would say, build me a machine 10 times faster so I can come back in a year. I'm going to use that 10 times bigger machine to do nothing but bluffing. Right? No new data. Just take two, uh, two bots and just let them play with each other a trillion games, even randomly at the beginning, never mind. But as long as one of them beat the other using the bluff method, it was given more credit. And just play a trillion games. And whichever come up with the most credit after a trillion games uh, must be the best bluffer. Right? Launched it, 2019, beat the four top poker players, and all four said, yeah, it bluffed really well now. Right? <laughs> so, uh, won $1.7 million. Yeah. All virtual money, by the way. Right? So, a few lessons to learn here. One, no new data was read in. The data was created by letting the two uh, bots play each other, but given a criteria yeah, a reward that if you won because of bluff is given more credits. Yeah. So there are times when data is not available but needs to be created. Next is energy. These things are huge, in, not only in training, energy consumption, but also during inference. During inference, right, when you're using the model, when you send the first word in, the whole trillion connection is fired up. Second word in, trillion connection is fired up. Third word in, trillion connection, it keeps firing up here. Yeah. So therefore, it uses up a lot of energy, not just in training, but also in inference, let alone in tuning. Tuning may be a bit less, but in inference, when you have thousands of people using the model, imagine this model keeps firing up, firing up, firing up, lots of energy consumed. That's the reason why, if you heard from Justin, energy efficiency of these models running on these supercomputers are important. AI native. So what I've done is I've taken the November, this last month, actually still this month, right? The 30th, yeah. No, this month's latest Green 500 list, picked the 20 fastest supercomputers in the world, 20 fastest, and then re-ranked them by energy efficiency, 58 0.02 says that it gives you 58.02 type of performance for every watt of power. So you want the bigger number, the better. I'm not saying which company builds a more energy efficient computer or not. Typically, the newer ones are more energy efficient, right? I'm just saying that this is our focus because we know not just in supercomputing, high performance computing, in physics, but also in AI native type architecture for large language models, for example, Lots of energy is consumed, and every 10% of a 20 megawatt system is two megawatt savings. I, I would like you all to register that, right? A supercomputer that is 20 megawatts, if you save 10% energy because you're more efficient, you have saved two megawatts. That's a huge savings, right? Especially when these things are firing up all the time with hundreds and thousands of people using them. There you go. The other area they are concerned about is regulatory. Let's have a look. This is the uh, Sony art competition, right? They are, uh, Sony, you can see over there, uh, last, this year. And there are many categories. The creative category was won by Boris. After he won first prize, he came out and said that uh, he did not create this picture. It was done with a large language model. Right? Uh, well, Sony took him off first place and gave the second place first place. Yeah. So this, after this issue, right? Uh, you know what? Uh, the next uh, competition, which is the Grammy Award. Yeah. 
And Grammy Award came up with a set of rules. Perhaps hearing about the Sony uh, issue here, right? Let's, uh, yeah. Let's see if we can use the word generative AI. Yeah, there we go. And this is the rule that uh, the Grammy Award came up with and say, you know, only human creators are eligible to, uh, for this prize. So I give you, I'm giving you this, uh, this example to let you know that uh, you know, we are, the, the industry is just starting to figure this out, right? Uh, what should you do? So these are the concerns of, uh, of the CXOs also. You can see uh, the US is coming up with their fact sheet. Go look this up. The White House has, has an executive order telling them by collecting the feedback from many of these proprietary companies, right, proprietary model companies, and coming up with a set of recommendations, you can see, yeah? Go to this website. The EU, from those in Europe, will have the EU AI Act. You can go to this website, can see, and as you're implementing your models, understand what the EU is thinking when it comes to eventually having regulations. In fact, they have a specific section on uh, generative AI. There we go. The last line is interesting. Publishing summaries of copyrighted data used for training. This one, take note. This one, this one is the one that got me uh, really alerted when the EU AI Act wrote this out. It means that you need to know what data you've used to train this model with. And you have to summarize it if the regulator comes in and asks you. I'm not saying that this is now a regulation, but these are the thinking yeah, of these eventual regulators. Right? So you have to tell them, report to them, what do you use, what do you train your model with? Has, it, has there any copyrighted data in there? Right? So these are the kinds of things that you take note of and are concerns of CXOs. But some are saying, for lack of a regulation for now, I'm just going to go ahead. Right? That's part of the reason why we acquired Pachyderm. You've heard the word MLDE, Machine Learning Development Environment, and, and, and uh, other tools that we built to track the type of data that's been used to train models with and create a report for you if the regulators come in, especially, for example, in finance. Yeah. Other than regulatory, there is consistency. CXOs are concerned that if you use a proprietary model that has been fine-tuned for behavior, they may be trained once because it costs hundreds of billions of dollars, right? But then, don't forget, it may be fine-tuned for behavior constantly. Because sometimes when you're coming up with an answer, it's not acceptable to the proprietary model handlers and they say, okay, let's tune this thing to be a bit tighter. Or when it gets too conservative, let's relax it a little. So over time, the model might be behaving slightly differently over time. So if you're using a proprietary model, you have no control over behavioral training, the CXOs are concerned about the consistency of its output of the things it's saying to your customers. So keep that in mind also. And then finally, there is edge and privacy. This one is another uh, significant topic on its own, because more and more, they are concerned about the fact that data, your data, and the data you'll be using, more and more of them is, are not created at the cloud now, but they are at, created at the edge. Let's have a look. So you used to have the edge that are more uh, fixed buildings, right, outside of the cloud, but as time went by, the quantity, then what you did was, as, as these entities, uh, land, data landed on these entities, you move all that data back to the cloud to be processed because that's where your computing power is. Right? That's where you have lost all your energy. But then as time went by, the number of these entities grow, ships and aircrafts right? start to also generate data. The minute they land, a commercial aircraft lands, data is downloaded. Right? because it's collecting while it's flying. Right? 
automobiles, let alone these EVs and self-driving cars, right? Massive amounts of data. I mean, I was at one of these sites where uh, they were sending these uh, autonomous cars out to collect data for training. What they do is there are about 10 petabytes of data collected by their fleet every day. There's so much data that uh, they can't transmit it wirelessly. What they do is they get the car to self-drive itself to the parking lot of the data center, and then someone comes down, pulls out the disk packs, and go up to upload it. Yeah. Right? And they're still doing it this way. So massive, massive amount of data, and let alone the number of cars that will be out there going forward. Drones, right? Let's not talk about the quantity of drones. Humans, right, carrying cell phones. Even a $10 light bulb can have Bluetooth and Wi-Fi in it. I, you can today go buy a $10 light bulb that can be connected by Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. So massive amounts of data with huge quantities of sensors out there, more and more to the point that you cannot, you see, imagine 55 billion devices by 25, one estimate, right? More than 50% of data by then will be created at the edge which means you can't afford to bring everything back to the cloud anymore. You have to figure out what you send back and what you don't. But that would be wasteful, and that's the reason why the edge needs to be intelligent. Right? You need to have some intelligence at the edge now, because if you want to fine-tune your model, if you want to do RAG, as you heard from uh, Justin's talk, a lot of that data is going to be landing at the edge, not at the cloud side. As you see, there's also this uh, uh, issue with how long it takes to move all that data back to the cloud, right? This is a long-term uh, example, but we're still sending these systems up uh, onto the space station. But it gives you a great example of distance and bandwidth to send your data. Dash line is where the, um, uh, the capsule will dock, and hard line is where the astronaut will be uh, installing the edge server. There are two 1U servers in the packaging for those who have not seen it. There is an update to this for those who have seen it, right? And basically, we did not do any modification. We just took two 1U server off the shelf at that time, right? It was 2017 at that time, but there's an update of that. And where astronaut Mark Van der Heer puts his hand up, ah, that's where he's going to install the, the server. Actually, on the station, there's no up and down, right? It depends on how you orientate the camera. Yeah, there we go. We spent six months making sure nothing complicated went wrong and forgot that the cables were too short. Yeah. So sometimes, you know, uh, sometimes the simple stuff actually gets here. So we needed a, a, a second astronaut to help. To prove, you can see that, uh, you know, there's uh, the HPE logo at the bottom there. It was during at the time when uh, HP acquired SGI. So in fact, on it was an SGI logo. And right before launch, uh, I asked one of our engineers to drive down to Houston with a screwdriver, yanked out the SGI logo, and super glued the HP logo there. <laughs> that's a story, true story, and that's the reason why uh, I can use it today. <laughs> right, we've got preparing, it has since uh, been refreshed, and the latest one will be an EL4000, 1U there, and a DL360, uh, right? Uh, that's being prepared in Houston for launch now. Yeah. So we are refreshing it constantly. Now, why do I bring this example up as the edge? It is the extreme edge, right? Edge above the cloud, <laughs> right? Yeah. Right. So it's essentially, there is one example where all these uh, sensors, they are, uh, they are collecting data from uh, on the space station, and it takes six hours to send that bunch of data to Earth to be processed on the uh, Azure cloud very fast, very, very quickly, within a few minutes, and the answer comes back. So the show crowd is very fast, right? Within a few minutes, the answer comes back. The problem is the six hours to send the data down. So with this Edge server, it doesn't take a minute to process that data. It takes half an hour to process the data. But half an hour is still faster than six hours to send the data. You see, if you have a slower computer at the Edge, even if it takes longer, than if you process in the cloud. But if the data transmission time is very long, it's worth it to have an edge, intelligent edge. This is the example I would like to emphasize, right? And you have many of these other examples on Earth where it takes longer to move your data, 
So might as well process it where you are collecting the data, even if it takes longer to process the data than in the cloud, because the transmission time is even longer. And then now, uh, here is one last example I will show you. Uh, Ayan Yun, for, have you all been, it's, it's, there's a press release out and I think they are in the show floor. And uh, between HPE, NVIDIA and Ayan Yun, we've checked out uh, the capability of this software to handle many, many cameras that can do object and feature identification. And, uh, uh, you know, and you can see one server at the bottom, which is, uh, uh, you know, a DL320 um, that co comprises uh, four of the L4 uh, NVIDIA cards, for inference, can handle 30 cameras and four servers, 200 cameras, and 20 servers, thousands of cameras, right? So you have the ca cameras here and you have thousands of cameras, right? Imagine it takes a long time to move all that thing in, into the cloud, yeah. Even if you, if you want to do it, the big question is, uh, do you want to afford to do it? So some say, yes, I will do it this way because I have a clean solution where all the cameras is connected to one point, or even though it, it is a long way out. But some are saying, I would like the edge where the cameras are to be intelligent, and you can then put some of these uh, servers out there for certain ones that you would like a faster answer to because it takes too long to move the data. Right? And so this is yet another example of intelligent edge. That's it. These are the two, four, six areas, right? And related to edge is privacy. When the data is landing at the edge, we have developed techniques of federated learning and swarm learning to isolate that data when they are at the edge. On that note, on these six concerns of the CXOs, thank you very much. And for those who would like to hear, uh, get more details, there is a five-minute version of a description on the fourth video on this. Uh, a playlist, YouTube playlist, and then uh, there is also an even longer 30 minute one for people who would like more details. And then, if you want to see an interview with uh, Jonas, who is the developer and CEO of Aleph Alpha, uh, go to do search on, on these keywords. Thank you very much. Yeah.